Well, we're coming to the end of our study uh, this evening, and uh, for those of you that weren't here last week, uh, in order to accommodate uh, the new uh, sessions that are coming forward, they actually start next week. So we had a little bit of a conflict there, and I told uh, the, the powers to be in the front office that I would just consolidate uh, the sessions into one this evening. So uh, I call this the power hour. So uh, put on your seat belts because we're going to be uh, covering probably about 200 years uh, this evening, so uh, uh, get ready. But uh, what I want to do first is uh, I want to go back and uh, go ahead and, Chris, and pull up that full, uh, full set of slides here. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, I got it. Okay, we're not... I'm not getting anything here. Oops. There we go. Okay. Uh, just to kind of bring us up to speed, you saw this last week. Uh, the Baptist movement begins. And two weeks ago, we talked about how it started. England to Holland, back over to England, First Baptist Church, uh, early 1600s. But it all starts back in Rome. And then we see the Church of England and uh, King James. Then we move on to the Puritan movement within the Church of England that wanted to reform what they had already done. And this is called the English Reformation. Now, there was a other Reformation that uh, Martin Luther started, and they're kind of going off on one track. And then we see another track is over in England, which starts with the Church of England being established as uh, Henry VIII broke off. Now, at first... It was a mirror of the Roman Catholic Church, the church in Rome. But then we move on to the Puritans. They wanted to make more changes, reform it more. Then there was a group within that group called the Separatists, Puritans plus others, that even wanted to go further in getting rid of some of the vestiges of not only the Church of England, but the Roman Catholic Church or the church in Rome. Some of those people were persecuted, and they left England, and they went over to Holland where they met the Anabaptists, Anabaptists meaning rebaptize. Uh, they were one of the first groups that actually understood the need to baptize at that age of accountability or knowledge of sin. Then they come back to England, and they establish the first Baptist churches in England, and then off to the Americas. Okay. And uh, one of the individuals, if you look down at your handout, uh, we'll start with the religious freedom in the Americas, and that really begins probably 1500s, early 1600s. Uh, many of the people that left England left England because of religious persecution. Uh, these separatists, these Puritans, found themselves being alienated, estranged. Many of them were put in jail. And that's why they first went to Holland, and now they're off to the Americas. Uh, many of the people that uh, uh, came over to the Americas escaped uh, for nothing more than adventure or money. There was money to be made because there were lots of different goods and commodities and resources uh, in the Americas. Uh, others, uh, we find the, the Catholics uh, found themselves uh, going to... Uh, as I have on the handout there, New Spain, which was down in, in Florida. Uh, some of the Catholics also went to uh, New France and Maryland, okay? Uh, but yet what we have is down with the Protestants, they found their way primarily into New England, uh, what we now call Massachusetts, and eventually what would be called the colony of Rhode Island. And at first, these were just unsettled areas, and they moved in there. But what we find is some of the early people uh, that came over to the United States, uh, John Smith or Smythe, however you want to uh, uh, pronounce his name, and uh, he was an Anglican priest, became a separatist, leaves London, uh, leaves uh, the Church of England, and then he's exiled. Separation of church and state were one of his mainstays. Uh, believer's baptism, he learned in in Holland or the Netherlands. Uh, he self-baptized himself, which I find interesting. Uh, introduced the positions and roles of pastor and deacon. Uh, this is where we actually find the title pastor, okay? 
Uh, poemon is the, the Greek word there, and that is kind of like the shepherd of the flock, and that's the pastor. Uh, he takes care of the people. And it was 1609, uh, and it was what was called a general Baptist church. And if you remember back a week or two, we talked about the difference between being a general Baptist and another, which we'll, we'll talk about here in just a second, general Baptists were the ones that believe Christ died for all. Christ died for all, okay? Uh, another guy, uh, Thomas Hules, uh, separatist, also imprisoned uh, to comply with the archbishop. He, he wouldn't uh, listen to the archbishop uh, in the Church of England, flees to Holland, uh, joint founder with Smith in Holland, breaks with Smith, and he becomes a particular Baptist. And the particular Baptists are ones that followed John Calvin's uh, theology, which was that there are people that were picked out, they were predestined, predetermined to be saved. And only them did Christ die for. Uh, typically within our Baptist family today, we believe that Christ died for all. Not all accept, not all hear, some reject, some say not right now, and others uh, just walk away. Uh, returns to London and establishes a Baptist church. Okay, uh, we talked last week a little bit about the uh, flight to America and how it came over, late 1500s, escape uh, religious persecution, left for adventure, monetary gain, uh, different locations. Uh, Protestants, as I mentioned, Massachusetts, Bay Colony, New York, Virginia area, and Lower Canada. That's typically where uh, the first Protestant groups uh, landed in the United States. All right, now we're uh, back on to your hand out there. Uh, who were some of the groups that actually came uh, into the United States? Well, uh, there were Anglicans. Uh, they were the people from the Church of England that came over. Now, in a little bit, we're going to come up on the time of the American Revolution. And, of course, if you know your history, uh, we defeated England in the Revolutionary War. Okay. Now, what happened was when England backed out of the United States, or rather the Americas, they just cut the Anglicans loose. They didn't support them. It was kind of like they said, okay, you were part of the Church of England. Okay, you want to be separate in the Americas? You're on your own. So the Anglicans were kind of uh, alienated and estranged, and out of the Anglicans comes later on John Wesley and the Methodist movement. He kind of comes in, scoops them up, uh, kind of uh, takes their theology in a little bit different fashion, and they become the Methodist church. Methodist comes from the word, there is a method. There is a method to come to know Christ and to be sanctified or grown closer to, to God. And here's a footnote that many people don't know. Out of the Methodist movement becomes several decades and centuries later, the Pentecostal movement comes out of the Methodist movement. Okay, uh, Methodist, as I just mentioned, they come over. Uh, Baptist, as we were talking about. Presbyterians come out of Scotland, where, that, where John Knox started that movement. Uh, and Lutherans coming out of Germany, uh, the Holland area, so on and so forth. They come over. Uh, and then we also have the Quakers, the Mennonites, the Moravians, the Hussites. Uh, some of you have never heard of these groups before. The Mennonites come out of uh, Menno Sims. Uh, who was an individual that kind of, when the Reformation was starting in Europe, he had his own ideas out of how to reform the church, and he started his own movement. Uh, of course, we have the Amish. That's another group. Uh, they came out of Switzerland uh, during the, the Reformation. So you can see that the Reformation, once it broke loose, they were just scattering. Uh, everybody had kind of their own ideas as to how to reform the church. And there's the, I believe that's the symbol for the Moravians. Uh, okay, Baptists in the New World. All right, in 1631, a separate, separatist minister, former uh, uh, priest in the Church of England, uh, Roger Williams, arrives in New England. He's already converted himself into the Baptist movement. 
1639, he organizes a Baptist church in Providence, Rhode Island. That is the first Baptist church in the Americas, 1639. Uh, the interesting dynamic at that point, though, was in this same area, there were other Protestant groups. Primarily, the Puritans were up there. And the Puritans did not like what the Baptists were preaching or teaching or their theology. So right away, the Puritans, who were the largest group, started persecuting the Baptists. Okay? Go figure. It's kind of like we're our own worst enemy sometimes as Christians. Uh, another individual that came over uh, from England was John Clark. He was a physician and co-founder of the Colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. Uh, he's an interesting character uh, in this whole dynamic because he comes in and he's starting to form the Baptist movement in this particular area. He's persecuted. He leaves and goes back to England and he goes before the king, and what he does is he gets a charter to actually make Rhode Island an official colony, and then comes back. The other thing about, uh, I believe it was uh, Clark, and I'll have to go back and look at my notes, he became uh, very close to the Narragansett Indian tribe, and actually learned their language, and uh, actually brought them into the fold of the American kind of like migration into the United States and uh, set up treaties with them and uh, was very helpful in normalizing relationships uh, with them. And uh, there was another, uh, the Pequot uh, Indian tribe was also in that area and was uh, terrorizing a lot of the colonies and everything. And because the Narragansett's uh, tribe supported through John Clark, they overcame the Pequot tribe, and uh, everything was settled right then. Okay, uh, and then Clark establishes a Baptist church in Newport, uh, Rhode Island, the colony of, in 1641. So this is the second uh, Baptist church. They're still in the minority in the Protestant movement uh, within the colonies at this point. But He's arrested, put in jail because they don't like Baptists, okay? And he spends time in jail, uh, I believe it was in Boston uh, at that time, but he's uh, eventually released, and, uh, he but he was banned in Massachusetts. But he used to sneak in to Massachusetts and try to uh, proselytize people uh, to follow the Baptist movement. Uh, New England, uh, eventually... Uh, he goes, uh, he's in New England, he goes to England, returns to Rhode Island, as I was saying. Uh, he was a proponent of soul liber liberty or soul competency. Did everybody get their Baptist faith message uh, in the back? Okay. Now, I would challenge you to at least uh, at first skim through that because you'll see this term, soul competency, in there. And that is such an important feature of the Baptist movement. It's a great liberty that we have in terms of reading Scripture, understanding Scripture through the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's also a great responsibility of everyone because it's your responsibility. You have a soul that is competent to come before God directly. You don't go through a priest. You don't have somebody else tell you what to do, but soul competency. Find that and uh, read, read through that. Okay, so Baptists in America, they, they are essentially, not completely, but essentially expelled out of New England. And where do they move? South. They move south, okay? And, of course, at this point, I always uh, find it interesting when you look back at these states, and, of course, Virginia looks large, but then it comes, becomes West Virginia and Virginia, and then half of North Carolina becomes what? Tennessee. Uh, you betcha. And then Mississippi and Alabama are taken out of uh, Georgia, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Baptist movement, the faith and, faith and, and others. Uh, as they move uh, forward. Uh, in 1706, uh, what we find is the, uh, 
the Philadelphia Baptist Association is formed. Why is that important? Well, if you look at who we are today in the Southern Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention is a, a loose form of churches that gather together to bring together money, resources, missionaries, printed material for Sunday school, other events for children, uh, developing curriculum, training people, so on and so forth. The convention doesn't tell each individual church what to do or how to do it, but what they do is they combine all the resources together. Independently, church, churches, small churches have limited resources. They can't reach out. But when we gather together, it becomes very impactive as to how we can reach out and evangelize and talk to other people and bring other people to Christ. So the formation of the, the Philadelphia Baptist Association is so important. That's the first gathering of Baptist churches in one, one group or association. It was a particular movement. Okay, Once again, that's a Calvinist leading where... Uh, only people that have been predestined are selected, and Christ only died for them. Now, this is going to change, and there's still a lot of debate going on amongst individual Baptist churches and the larger association as to whether we're more particular or more general. That, that discussion continues on. Uh, eventually, they adopt the London Confession. Now, the London Confession was one of the early confessions coming out of the Baptist movement. As I mentioned to you earlier, we as Baptists today are not a confessional church. We don't raise our hand and confess something. We don't have a creed that we are uh, glued to. We have the Baptist faith message, which gives you a framework so you kind of understand the big chunks of our theology or how to know God, whether it's, uh, you know, Scripture, the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture, uh, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, so on and so forth. That, that's what that framework is for. And then you are competent, soul competency, to go before God, read Scripture, and determine what that means to you as an individual. Great great responsibility, and also a liberty. Okay, so London Confession. Uh, then 1630 to 16, uh, 1730 to 1760, the first great awakening begins in the United States. Okay, well, okay, this, this is when uh, spiritually the Holy Spirit just starts to invade churches and individuals, and they just rise up, and there's excitement, and it's a revival, and that's what the Great Awakening is. It's, a, it's a, the first revival in the United States. It's evangelical in nature. Uh, prior to the Baptist movement, if you would go in an Anglican church, a Roman Catholic church, if you would go in uh, an Orthodox church, uh, if you heard something from the gospel or the, for the, from the Bible, it was a message about the law, the law of God, okay? That's primarily Old Testament, okay, the law of God, whether it's uh, uh, the Ten Commandments or whether it's the Pentateuch or whatever. It was the law that you were hearing. It's kind of that classic fire and brimstone, you know, your sinners and so on and so forth. Uh, along come the Baptists and they weren't alone, but primarily their, their whole message was evangelical. It was, it was the gospel message. It was the good news. Now, they also took into account that the Old Testament law is a convictor. Nobody can meet all of the laws, okay? And it's a lamp unto thy feet. It gives you guidance, and okay? And Christ comes and covers our sins that fall in those, those areas. Okay, uh, some of the people, George Whitfield, uh, John Wesley, and Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards were the key players in this first great awakening. Now, Jonathan Edwards is uh, known for one of his most fiery sermons, which is titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Any of you ever hear uh, that, yeah, that's, that's the guy. That's the guy there. He was just a very prominent, very almost outspoken uh, preacher. 
But the thing about the Great Awakening, as we look back on it, it was multi-denominational. It was multi-denominational. How many of you have ever been to a tent revival? Okay, yeah. I, I remember the last one that uh, my wife and I went to was in Crystal River, Florida. And I mean, they had these huge tents, and they had choirs from all over the southeast that were in there. And, and I remember uh, when they did an altar call, you know who one of the first individuals to, to answer the altar call was? A Catholic nun. A Catholic nun came forward and accepted Christ as her personal Savior. That was, everybody was just like stunned. She was in her habit and everything. It was like, wow, wow, what a, what a change. But uh, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists were all part of this first great awakening and reaching out into the community and uh, reaching uh, people for the sake of Christ. There's John Wesley. Okay. Uh, Baptists and other, uh, others in the Americas. Uh, the emotional movement of the Great Awakening was at a certain point opposed by the Baptist movement back then. You might say, well, why? Well, they just felt it was too emotional. Uh, some might say too, uh, almost too charismatic, uh, that type of a movement. And, and at first, the Baptists kind of backed away, okay? Uh, but the movements kept going. Uh, at that same time, because believers' baptism was being brought into that, that moved a lot of people to the Baptist faith because they came to recognize that, oh, okay, that, that age of accountability, that age of knowledge, yes, be immersed, be baptized, accept Christ and be baptized. So that was a great infusion of people uh, back at this time. Many Baptists and Methodists were moved to preach the, the gospel. And, you know, to us today, this almost sounds incredible that that, that would, you know, oh, we're going to preach the gospel. We take that for granted, but this was a movement that was once again going from preaching the law, and many of these preachers, whether they were Anglican or whoever, would stand up in front of you for an hour, and they would read kind of a monologue to you, and it was very difficult, and it really wasn't very moving. And then when these pastors and preachers started preaching from inside the truth, you know, from their heart, it made what a difference it made. Uh, in the movement. Uh, 1773, John Lyle establishes the first African American Baptist church. And I believe it was in, it was either in Savannah, I believe it was in Savannah, Georgia, someplace in Georgia. But this was the first African, chartered African American church uh, in the United States. Uh, by 1793, the uh, uh, the Philadelphia Association uh, gathered resources together and sent William Carey. This is in the 1700s, and already the Baptists are sending missionaries overseas. Wow. They didn't wait too long. They said, we've got to get the word out. We've got to get the word out. And then uh, between 1800 and 1830, there's a second great awakening uh, in the United States. And this, now this, this is really a big surprise, started at colleges, universities, and then throughout the whole frontier. Do you think there's ever a chance of a great awakening in our major universities today? <laughs> I, I, I would agree with you. I would really hope so that uh, somebody would uh, uh, start one and uh, very quickly. Uh, yeah, one of the uh, interesting things about... Uh, these early churches uh, and their movements is that uh, some of them actually, some of these major church movements actually established universities. Can you guess as to two universities that were actually established by Christian denominations? Harvard and Yale, you're right. Uh, Princeton, uh, also Presbyterian. Uh, of course, over the years, what happened was uh, Princeton University and Princeton Seminary did what? <laughs> they split. They kind of went two different ways. But yeah, Yale and Harvard are uh, two. Uh, 
1801, a Presbyterian minister organizes the, the Kentucky Cane Ridge Revival. Um, this was a classic tent revival in Kentucky, and uh, the number of people that attended this revival equated to 10% of the whole population of Kentucky. That's, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Uh, but that was in the early 1800s. Uh, Methodists and Baptists once again join together for a larger movement, and they start holding what are called camp meetings. And camp meetings were no more than they, they'd go out someplace, set up a tent, send out advertisements, bring people in, have music, and preach the gospel. And their message at this time was a very strong come-to-Jesus gospel message, once again, versus a law uh, message. It was a message about the good news of Jesus. Uh, independent Baptist churches begin to make alliances. In other words, they started gathering together uh, to have, you know, local uh, associations uh, to gather uh, their energy and their resources together. Uh, so much different uh, back then where you had Baptist churches definitely wanted to be independent. They wanted to be independent from the state. But now they said, you know, it's, it's good. Let's talk. Let's collaborate. Let's bring together our, our resources. Uh, in 1814, uh, Baptists formed the General Missionary Board at what was called the Triennial uh, Convention. Triennial because the, this Baptist group would meet every third year. Uh, but Another great movement forward, actually talking about specifics of sending missionaries overseas. Missionaries overseas. Now, we move into the Baptist in the uh, time, what I call the uh, pre-Baptist Civil War uh, era. Uh, of course, we had slavery at that time. Uh, the Baptist Foreign Mission Board was moved up temporarily to Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I could not find out why that was done. There were probably some politics involved in that. Uh, at this pre-Civil War period in the 1840s, 50s, there began some friction between churches in the North and the South. They had really two different positions. Uh, in the North, they were abolitionists. In the South, they were, you know, many of them were slaveholders. Uh, Northern abolitionists, Southern slaveholders. Uh, one of the things that the mission board said was no slaveholders could be missionaries. Now, that was a kind of a seminal point in terms of really splitting the churches in the north and the south. The north said, no, if, if you have slaves, you, you can't be a missionary. You can't go overseas. And the, uh, the folks in the churches in the south, the Baptist churches really resented that. Uh, in 1845, the brethren in the north suggested a split. An amicable split. Let's just, you know, uh, go our own way. Now, I don't know how many of you are uh, former Methodists, but uh, that's the, the roots uh, way back in my childhood. I grew up as a Methodist, United Methodist. Uh, and uh, next month, no, I'm sorry, uh, May, uh, they are formally splitting the United Methodist Church. Okay, they're going to split it in half. And half is going to be conservative, and the other half, uh, if I can use the general term, liberal. Okay? And they're just splitting and going their own ways. What a shame. What a shame that it has to come to that. Uh, Baptist and the Civil War. Okay, 1845, Baptists finally meet in Augusta, Georgia, and organize the Southern Baptist Convention. So now what you had was you have Southern Baptists and you have Northern Baptists. Does anybody know what the, uh, the Northern Baptist Church eventually changed their name to? They are the American Baptist Church, USA. Okay, uh, Much, much smaller than Southern Baptist. Uh, I think at last count there was only 1.6 million uh, members in American Baptist churches. But they're all over the United States. There are very few of them in the Southeast United States. Uh, and the, the Northern Baptists, uh, are, uh, they span from being ultra-conservative to ultra-liberal. Now, if you were going to guess where the most conservative American Baptist churches are located, what state would you guess? You can just call it out. California. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's because once you get outside of San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, the rest of California is pretty conservative. And that's where those American Baptist churches are located. Uh, Some of the more liberal ones are up in the the Northeast. Okay, and I won't talk anymore about my brothers and sisters in the American Baptist Church. Okay, Uh, boards for foreign and domestic operations are formed in the Southern Baptist uh, group. Uh, in uh, February 1861, uh, Confederate States of America is formed, and then right in succession to that, Baptists in the South pledge allegiance to the Confederacy. I, you know, I, you know I've, I've thought a lot about that, and although that was a, a statement right out of a uh, church history book, I would say that that was probably uh, uh, the local, local groups and church leaders. I'm not sure that everybody... Uh, in, in those churches, you know, stuck up their hand and said, yeah, I, I swear allegiance. But as church groups, uh, they swore allegiance to the Confederacy. Churches in the South, the Baptist churches in the South, suffered enormously uh, during uh, the uh, Civil War. And there we go. All right, Baptist movement post-Civil War. Uh, in the period of 1860-1870, Sunday schools become prevalent in the U.S. and England. And I'll, uh, I'll kind of jump ahead in this uh, talk and tell you that Sunday schools have their origin in England. And there was a time before child labor laws where little kids, as soon as they could get up and do things, you know, probably 8, 9, 10 years old, uh, they were put into factories, they were put into coal mines, and they were working uh, six days a week, and they were not in school. And so what many of the churches in England did was, on Sundays, when they, they get these kids to come to church on Sundays, and they would have a school there to teach them. And of course, how did they teach them to read? Using the Bible. Okay, and that was Sunday school. And eventually that movement kind of comes over to the United States and takes uh, an initial form and then a different form uh, that we have it uh, today. Uh, Then in 1863, SBC votes to establish the Sunday School Board. Okay, now they're really going to formalize it. Uh, They're going to have people that are designing curriculum, deciding what to teach the kids, how to teach the kids in terms of Bible study, so on and so forth. Uh, That set the stage for a convention-wide Sunday school system at all churches. You know, they reached out, okay, we're the Southern Baptist Convention. We would suggest you do this. Uh, We have the material for you, and, and here it is. And, of course, most churches thought, wow, this is great. You know, let's, let's do this. Uh, there are many Christian denominations that do not have Sunday school. They do not have Bible study. They just have a worship service. And that's all. And that's all. Uh, I was, uh, when we were living in uh, Crystal River, Florida, uh, I was on staff at our local church, and I went out to the local uh, Presbyterian church just to meet uh, the pastors out there. And uh, we were just talking about our operations and uh, attendance. And I said, how many people do you, do you have uh, that attend your Sunday school in the morning? And he kind of chuckles and he says, oh, that's such a Baptist thing. <laughs> I went, oh, well, okay. Well, you know, I think we've got it. <laughs> it works well for us. Uh, okay, uh, 1877, the Louisville Seminary is established. That is the, uh, the first uh, seminary. Eventually, it became Southern Seminary, uh, one of six uh, Southern Baptist seminaries uh, that now exist, one out in Ontario, California, uh, Gateway Baptist Seminary. Then there's Midwest, and there's Southeastern, Southern, Southeastern. Yeah, that's, that's all of them right there. Uh, Here's an interesting thing that occurred within the general Protestant group uh, of uh, evangelical Christians in the United States. By 1892, uh, a lot of what, what I would generally call liberalism was kind of making its way into the, the church. Uh, and there were a lot of people that were pastors and theologians that were very disappointed with this. 
And so there was a group uh, of pastors and theologians and uh, seminary professors that got together. They met in Niagara Falls and they produced the five fundamentals or what was eventually called fundamentalism. Uh, now, the word fundamentalism has been hijacked by other groups and, uh, you know, oh, they're, they're fundamentalists. Well, yeah, I would hope that we were fundamentalists because what they did was they sat down and said, what are the fundamentals of the faith? You know, like, who is God? Uh, what did Jesus do, uh, and so on and so forth. And there were five fundamentals that kind of uh, followed what we talked about many weeks ago, the five solos of the faith, okay? Fundamentalism. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, okay, now we uh, move ahead to the, uh, the modern Baptist church. As I said, actually, that should be six major seminaries, uh, plus or minus 15 it's just shy of 15 million members. It's like uh, 14 million 923,000 uh, Baptists uh, on site. Uh, over 47,000 uh, Baptist churches uh, that are out there. That number is slightly down from the last time uh, they counted all the churches. Just slightly down. We're classified generally as Protestant now. Understand uh, that when the Reformation came, remember there are two arms. There's the, the Martin Luther group that's going off in this direction. And then we, we find the Anglican church is formed. But as the Anglican church uh, is formed, it's basically adhering to all the, the trappings of Roman Catholicism. Well, then we have the, the Puritans really start what is called the English Reformation. And then we go on to the separatists, and then eventually we have the Baptists coming out of that. So we're part of that larger Protestant family that kind of like went this direction, but then kind of came back together. So we're considered Protestants. Remember, that word Protestant comes from those uh, princes and other people in Germany that protested what the Catholic Church in Rome and the Holy Roman Empire was doing to Martin Luther, Okay. That would be a great test question. Have you all gone to the last page in your handout yet? Oh, no, don't. <laughs> okay, uh, orientation, uh, Baptist theology. Our theology, remember that word theology is two words. It's theos, which means God, and ology, which comes from the word logos, words, thoughts, and ideas. So when we say theology, we're talking about words, thoughts, and ideas about God, okay? Uh, our theology is evangelical. We, we want to reach out. Uh, we we want to go to Detroit. I don't know that I want to go to Detroit, but we go to Detroit, uh, and we go to Honduras, and we support other missionaries overseas. We're evangelical. Uh, not all Christian denominations, Protestant denominations, are that evangelical. Uh, you think about it. If you're predisposed to predestination, Okay, one of those uh, Calvinistic positions uh, that there's only certain people uh, have been pre-selected to have knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. Okay, well, if it's all predetermined, why should we go out and evangelize people? Okay, of course, at the same time, if you say people are pre-selected, you predetermine that some are going to hell. Now, I don't believe that. Okay, Christ died for all. Okay, we're evangelical. Okay, uh, our polity or, or the way that we're organized, uh, whether it's uh, deacons, we, we vote, we're an independent church, we make our decisions, we have committees. Remember, that comes out of the Reformation that, you know, different groups that were reforming the church said, well, I think members ought to be on committees. I think members ought to be part of the government of, of the church. So we are congregational versus elder or versus bishop forms of, of government, okay? Uh, we've got about 4,000 missionaries in 126 countries today. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Uh, I, I read an article last year that said the uh, uh, one Christian uh, church in a country is actually sending missionaries back over to the United States. That's South Korea. 
Some of their churches over there just caught on fire. They're sending missionaries over here. Go figure. We're, what are we doing? Okay. Uh, Southern Baptist Convention. Okay. Let's talk about the Lord's Supper. Now, uh, on the night that Christ was betrayed, okay, he took the bread, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Uh, take and eat and often as you do this, remember, remember what I did for you. I, I hung on a cross. I paid for your sins. Okay. And then after the bread, at the end of the meal, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood that was poured out for you. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Well, okay, that was wine, folks, that he was drinking. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, it was probably diluted wine. Uh, well, <laughs> no, it was wine, you know, diluted or not, it was, it, was, it was wine. Well, there came a time in the church in America where alcohol was being abused at a high level, okay? And we're talking about the mid-late 1800s. And uh, the Methodist movement, part of their sanctification, purification process, they were trying to determine how to uh, take the fruit of the vine that was not fermented, okay, as part of the Lord's Supper, okay? So enter Thomas Branwell Welch. He was a minister, actually minister slash dentist from England, okay? Uh, they wanted unfermented wine. He steps in, and what he does is he develops a process of pasteurizing uh, grape juice, okay, so that it doesn't go bad and doesn't ferment, okay? Uh, you know what his product is today, don't you? Welch's grape juice, okay? You know, the, the family name stunk. Uh, eventually called Dr. Welch's unfermented wine, also Welch's grape juice, right there in front of you. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, that's why some churches use grape juice, some still use, use wine, and that's just kind of a denominational uh, church. I've told the story how uh, our church in Dayton uh, did a combined service one day with the, uh, an evangelical Lutheran church in town, and, and I was asked to uh, assist the pastor or their priest there in, in giving of the the Eucharist. They called it the Eucharist, giving thanks. And so uh, he's up there, he's reading some dialogue, and he's breaking the bread, and he, he'd take a, a sip of, and it was wine, and he'd take another sip, read something, and, and I'm standing there. I didn't really know what to do. I'd never been in a Lutheran service before. And, and eventually he gets done, and he takes the cup, and he sets the cup like right in front of me, okay? And I'm thinking, what am I supposed to do? So I, I started to move the cup, and, and under his breath, he goes, don't touch it. <laughs> and I just kind of kind of went back to kind of, you know, dress right dress, <laughs> you know, wait for your, your orders. And, and he, had to, he had to finish the cup, okay? And any of you that have gone into a Catholic church or an Orthodox church know that that is consecrated, uh, no different from the bread. And so you don't pour consecrated, you know, uh, wine, you know, down, down the drain, Oh, no, uh, just like uh, the, uh, the ashes on Ash Wednesday, uh, if they're left over, those are consecrated ashes. You just don't throw them in the dumpster. Uh, but uh, we got that straight, and he finally hands me a tray, and he says to me, off mic, he says, okay, he said, this half is grape juice, and this half is wine. So when they come to the altar, uh, you need to say, juice or wine? juice or wine. And so, so I'm up there going like this, you know, <laughs> going like, juice or wine, you know, I go like that. We got through it. It was, uh, it was a good educational moment uh, for me. So, uh, okay. So that's Dr. Welsh, and that's why we drink grape juice. Uh, Sunday schools, uh, mid-1700s, laborers in England, and I said, working six days a week, lack basic education, church stepped in and set up schools and churches on Sunday. Okay, uh, William Fox was the uh, kind of the guy that really got this moving, the Sunday School Society, uh, part of the Church of England, okay, but a great idea uh, that now has morphed into, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's wonderful that we come into worship, and that word worship comes from the old English word worth-ship, 
worth-ship, which means to uh, attribute to value, reverence, and honor to someone or something. So when we come into worship, we are to attribute great value, honor, and reverence to God Almighty. That's what worship is supposed to be about. Okay, so, but Sunday school is such an important feature that so many people, they just come into worship service and then they leave. And it's really in most Baptist churches, it's a minority of the people that come into worship that actually come early for Sunday school or stay late for Sunday school. They just come in and worship and then they leave. I'm not begrudging them for that. I'm just saying they miss a big piece of fellowship, support, and learning. So important. Okay, William Fox. Uh, the movement becomes, uh, comes to the colonies, United States, and adopted by uh, Baptist churches. And there he is, Mr. Fox. Okay, let's talk about church buildings. You know, why are church buildings so uh, classic? Uh, early churches, catacombs, businesses, homes, we've talked about that. Post-Constantine era, okay, uh, moving into the 4th century, simple buildings uh, specific to worship, nothing special. Uh, progression to larger, more opulent buildings. Uh, we have uh, uh, basilicas. Uh, basilica is a Latin word which uh, actually means uh, just a large public building. Okay, But if you think about it, a church is, in a sense, a large public building. It's for the public. It's for specifically for uh, worship. And so churches moving across the centuries there became larger and more opulent, flying buttresses and, and the tall steeples, so on and so forth. About 1,000 B.C., basilicas, cathedrals with towers and belfries were built. Uh, some of the cathedrals, uh, if you do a historical study of them, in uh, parts of uh, Germany and France, some of them took like 100, 150 years to build. They were such complex structures uh, that they put up. Almost, I would say, uh, I mean, they're beautiful. Uh, having been in like Westminster Cathedral and, and Notre Dame, uh, they are just amazing pieces. But my question always is, you know, could the money that was spent for that, could that have been better used in some other way? I think taking a, an old Walmart and renovating it is just such a great idea. And we had a church a little bit north of ours in uh, St. Petersburg that they took a Kmart <laughs> and made a church out of it. Uh, what a great way to honor God. Uh, a cathedral technically is the uh, local uh, residence, uh, residential worship center for the highest uh, bishop in a local Catholic community, okay? Uh, although there are some Protestant churches that have called themselves the cathedral or, you know, okay. Uh, continues through the Reformation. They get larger earlier ch early churches in the United States. You know, there's, there's your, your standard picture. Uh, you have the belfry and you have the, the spire that goes up in the air. Uh, most uh, uh, archaeological uh, you know, historians will say that that was kind of modeled after early civilizations and uh, communities that used that as much as anything as a watchtower. And they just kind of uh, took that in in combination with a sense that that spire was reaching up to God, up to heaven. Yeah. Okay, church architecture, there you go. Spire the lantern, the belfry, and then the uh, tower structure. The only uh, downside to this uh, early on in the, uh, in the United States was these were very prone to lightning strikes. And there were a whole lot of them that was, it was the highest feature in a community, and a lot of them wound up burning down, okay? Today we have things like lightning rods. I think We've got them up on the church up there. Uh, here's one of the churches that I was the associate pastor on, uh, First Baptist Dayton, Ohio. Completely different architecture. Uh, this is more in the, the classic, you know, 1800s scheme. Uh, this particular church was the church that Orville and Wilbur Wright uh, worshipped at. And my office there was the, uh, uh, the office that the pastor that did Orville Wright's funeral it was really, it had like 
carved German architecture in it. I, I even had my own bathroom. I mean, this was really cool. And a fireplace. And I had a little fireplace. Didn't, didn't ever try to start a fire in it since it was built like uh, in the uh, late 1800s. I didn't want to test that out. Uh, okay. Uh, I believe this is on your uh, bibliography. Uh, this is a great book. Uh, I know people always walk up to me and say, Phil, have you ever heard of the... And they'll throw out a denomination. I'll go, yeah, I've heard of it. Well, what do they believe? Well, if you get this book, and it's not all that expensive, this has like every denomination you can think of. Uh, some Christian, some non, non-Christian uh, some borderline that we think are a bit heretical, uh, but it's a, it's a great book. Uh, they revise it every couple of years, but I would suggest you get it, and uh, you'll find out uh, the name of that church that your cousin's going to. You'll find out what they really, really believe. Uh, okay, uh, it's been my pleasure. Um, thank you. Uh, it, <laughs> I, I, I enjoy teaching this class because it helps me kind of remember what the roots are of our denomination. If you would, the very last page in your handout is an evaluation. Uh, I do this at the end of every class. I need feedback, and then I give this to the front office and let them know so that if changes need to be made, uh, and you can just rip that last page off. Do everybody have that eva- it's not on there. Uh, uh, oh, well. Hired help. What can I say? <laughs> oh, well. I don't know what to do at this point. I'm not going to get evaluated. <laughs> well, it was a nice idea, wasn't it? Well, let's do this uh, before we close. Uh, what are your questions in, in general or specifically that you you might have. Uh, This last hour was uh, kind of like, uh, whew, kind of like moving through 200 years there uh, real quick, and I had to kind of consolidate some of the information uh, in it to make sure that we could get it in here while it's uh, two minutes to seven. Wow. (laughs) Get on that pony and ride. Any questions? Mary Lou, you don't have a question? Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I've actually had a couple of people that have come back a second time. And, uh, <laughs> and hopefully I said the same thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a few people in here that, uh, you know, have gone back and said, I think I'm going to look into that just to see if that's... And, and, and what you'll find is if, if you do historical research, in particular on the history of Christianity you will find some different opinions on some points uh, in, in, you know, the, the studies. And, uh, you know, I've, I've read through and took numerous uh, graduate courses in it and even found some of the professors, well, I think it was really this way rather than that way. It was this year rather than that year. So there are some minor differences. Yes, sir? Uh, I believe so. I believe so. I th- I think Chris told me that. Uh, just ask the church office for the link, okay? You can go back and, <laughs> you know, review it. I wish there was a way that I could have uh, gotten that evaluation to y'all. But uh, if you if you have any, uh, you want to give any feedback, uh, uh, Carol and I are on Realm. So you can send me an email and say, I have a question about this, or, you know, I thought I understood it this way. You know, feel, feel free, okay? Uh, 